viewers welcome to Ronnie Nerd Science and today here I am with my new video and in this video we are going to discuss about a very specific disease condition of the nervous system so in this video we are going to discuss about meningitis meningitis guys meningitis is nothing but the inflammation of the three layers or the three meninges on the brain and the spinal cord itself First of all, let me tell you one thing that brain and spinal cord is protected or covered by three layers of tissues. First one is the innermost layer, that green one is the innermost layer, that orange one is the middle one and the pink one is the outermost layer. So outermost layer guys, the pink one is your dura mater. The middle one is your arachnoid matter and the innermost layer guys it is your PA matter or PA matter. DAP DAP means dura matter is the outermost layer of the brain and the spinal cord and the arachnoid matter is the middle layer, PA matter is the innermost layer. So guys, in the meningitis, they, uh, these layers got inflamed by any bacterial infection, any viral infection or any fungal infection as well. The main causes of meningitis is bacteria, virus or any fungal infection. So these layers got inflamed in this condition, in this very condition of meningitis and uh, the main, let's, let us discuss about the causes so let's start causes like basic causes of this uh, condition guys first one is your bacterial infection and bacterial infection is there second is viral infection and third is any fungal infection there are so many causes of meningitis disease condition but the most common causes of meningitis is bacteria, virus and fungal. Other causes of meningitis are any direct trauma, any direct trauma to the brain leads to meningitis when any bacteria or anything like any bacteria sweeps into the, these meninges and these meninges got inflamed after the bacterial invasion and then some specific bacteria are responsible for causing meningitis and the first one is Neisseria meningitidis Or you can say Neisseria meningitis, and the second one is Streptococcus pneumoniae, guys. Streptococcus pneumoniae. These two bacteria are highly responsible for causing meningitis or inflammation of these DAP, dura arachnoid and pyometer, and uh, cause this very disease condition of meningitis, Neisseria meningitidis and Streptococcus pneumoniae. These two bacteria are highly responsible. And let's talk about the viral infection. Some viruses of enterovirus family. Viruses of enterovirus family are highly responsible for causing meningi uh, meningitis. Guys, and uh, some fungal infection as well. The direct trauma. Third thing is, last thing is, guys, secondary infection. Secondary infection. So, guys, let me tell you one thing that how any secondary infection, apart from your brain and spinal cord. Uh, let's suppose uh, any client or any patient got infected from any bacteria 
apart from his brain and the spinal cord, let's suppose he is having any bacterial infection uh, in his body, then that very uh, bacterial infection, how it may cause uh, meningitis. So the pathophysiology of secondary infection is uh, nothing but if any person got bacterial infection, that very bacteria uh, like uh, moves into the brain and the spinal cord by circulatory system, circulatory medium or blood circulation as well as lymphatic circulation. Through lymphatic circulation and through circulatory system, do those secondary bacterial infection got invade in the, uh, these layers and crossing the triple B, the blood brain barrier, after crossing the blood brain barrier, it will cause meningitis in the brain and the spinal cord. So guys, moving onwards, let's discuss about the basic sign and symptoms of this condition. Sign and symptoms of this condition. Like uh, very basic uh, uh, sign and symptoms of this condition of uh, meningitis, guys, are like fever, malaise, chills, loss of consciousness, consciousness as well, LOC. Some uh, guys, some signs are there to diagnose or to find out whether the patient is suffering from meningitis or not. And those signs are, first one is your Kernick sign. It's Kernick sign. And the second sign is Bredinsky sign. Some another sign and symptoms of meningitis include increased intracranial pressure, increased ICP. In this condition, in the condition of meningitis, some sort of increase in, in intracranial pressure can uh, visualize. And uh, next is scissors. as well as neck stiffness neck stiffness is there uh, with the patient and with memory impairment as well some sort of memory impairment So the basic sign and symptoms of this condition guys is fever, malaise, chills, loss of consciousness, increased intracranial pressure and epilepsy or scissors, neck stiffness with some sort of memory impairment. And uh, two signs, two major signs, two main portions, two main signs are there to diagnose that very disease condition, meningitis condition. First sign is your Kernick sign whose positivity tell a doctor whether the patient is positive, whether the patient is suffering from meningitis or not. The first sign is your Kernick sign and the second one is your Bredinsky sign. But in the Kernick sign guys, Kernick sign, uh, let's suppose a patient is lying on his back. In, uh, now, now we are going to discuss, now we are discussing about Kernick sign. Suppose a patient is lying in front of you on his back. So the examiner asks the patient to flex his leg and thigh from his hip. Suppose this is the table on which this patient is lying down. We are discussing about the Kernick sign. And the examiner asks the, this patient, this very patient to fold his leg from his thighs and try to touch the stomach or abdominal region. When the patient uh, fold his leg, 
he feels or he feels a severe pain okay the patient feels a severe pain when he tries to fold uh, his leg and from his hip if the patient uh, feels a sharp throbbing pain uh, that's the positive sign that the positive Kernick sign which directly reflect that the patient is suffering from meningitis or meningitis next sign is guys Bredinsky sign and uh, same in the Bredinsky sign guys suppose this is the table or the bed and here is a patient lying down in supine position now the examiner asks this patient to flex his neck forward like this patient when this patient tries to flex his or her neck like in forward motion he feels a uh, like uh, severe pain and what next when he flex his neck automatically uh, involuntarily uh, involuntarily is the right term when he flexes his neck to uh, like uh, in this position his or her legs involuntarily flexed involuntarily these uh, uh, legs uh, of this patient got flexed and flexion involuntary flexion of the legs of the patient shows that the patient is suffering from meningitis so now we are going to discuss about the diagnostic evaluations diagnostic evaluation of meningitis condition so first so first diagnostic procedure is your CT scan next one is MRI CSF culture why CSF culture guys CSF culture uh, is to diagnose is to find out the very basic very like reasonable bacteria or any infection which is responsible for causing meningitis CT scan is there, MRI scan is there and CSF culture is there and is your neurological examination neurological examination as well and the diagnostic uh, evaluation uh, consists of CT scan, MRI scan, CSF culture to rule out very specific bacteria, viral or fungus uh, which is responsible for causing like meningitis neurological examination is an another criteria for diagnosing meningitis or to rule out uh, like uh, um, uh, through which extent the patient's uh, neurological system or his or her cognitions uh, like these intellectuals uh, are decreased or uh, like uh, we can say uh, the patients when the patient got uh, uh, this meningitis condition and we uh, did the neurological examination of that very specific patient uh, his or her cognitions got uh, reduced by some extent so we can uh, rule out or the, find out uh, uh, that by neurological examination as well now moving onwards, let's start by discussing the management management of meningitis. So first of all, guys, like uh, I previously said, that secondary infection then uh, that the patient uh, who's having any secondary infection, any secondary bacterial or fungal infection in his or her body and that very infection uh, like uh, moves into his or her brain or the spinal cord by crossing the triple B blood brain barrier by circulatory system or your lymphatic system same in the management like uh, we have to decide a specific uh, medication so we should uh, like administer some specific medications uh, those medications 
such those medications who, who uh, crosses the triple B. Remember one thing: these bacteria or these in, uh, infections crossing the triple B and then inflaming the these three layers. And we have to administer some sort of medications who like uh, who have a penetrating power of uh, triple B and goes directly behind that particular bacteria and kill that particular bacteria as well. So, penicillin G along with cefotaxim. Penicillin G along with cefotaxim should be administered to the patient uh, who is hospitalized for this very condition. So if the patient is having scissors or epilepsy, so we should administer, uh, administer some sort of anti scissor or anti-epileptic drugs. Anti-epileptic drugs or anti scissor drugs such as phanitoin. Antibiotics, these antibiotics and some uh, symptomatic drugs should be administered to the patient uh, for the management of this condition. Hope you like this video. Do subscribe, share and like this video.